Following its referendum and a fairly prolonged legislative process, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. Within the deadline set by its latest Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, of January 31st, 2020, the withdrawal agreements have been signed and countersigned, and the new transition period, which will last at least a year, has started. This is definitely a triumph, because it can be done and it can be done peacefully. But it is also a tragedy because a slim majority of voters that do not represent a majority of the population decided on the future of the country for decades to come, highlighting again the shortcomings of the current democratic processes. So let's look at some analogies and let's look at what set up the process like this, what allows the process like this. And let's look at the meaning of Brexit for the UK as well as the implications for the rest of the EU and the world. If you think about it, 150 years ago, a bunch of southern state of another union, of the USA, decided that they wanted to secede. And that process was all but peaceful. The northern states said, you want to leave? Well, we'd rather kill you. And of course, the reasons for the southern states, states to leave were horrible. They wanted to keep slavery legal. And the reasons for the northern states to impose their will, keep the union together and make slavery illegal across the Union were right, especially right if you asked them, and especially right because they won. But the means by which those objectives have been reached were extremely bloody, extremely violent, and anybody who died in the process could tell you that from their point of view it may not have been worth it. Or those of more heroic disposition would eventually tell you that it was worth it. But if there are alternative ways of resolving conflicts, isn't that wonderful not to have to wage a war and kill tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of people. And blood is not flowing on the streets of London. When the European Union learned about the results of the referendum, war preparations didn't start. There was no need. The Lisbon Treaty, which is a 600-page monstrosity that should have been a slimmer, maybe less prescriptive, more inspiring European constitution that couldn't happen at the time because during the process of ratifying it, Two relatively smaller members of the EU, if I am not mistaken, Czechia, then the Czech Republic, 
and the Netherlands voted it down and as a consequence it couldn't be adopted because it had to be adopted by unanimous decision. Well, the Lisbon Treaty organizes and, and uh, prescribes and uh, defines all kinds of components of the way that the EU works, including the now famous or infamous Article 50 that defines how a member state can separate itself from the EU. Invoking Article 50 is a fundamental new component of social and political and also economic organization. As far as I know, in the past, there hasn't been an example of a political unit that felt strong enough and self-confident enough to codify the ability of one of its members to secede, to separate. And if there were, please let me know. I am curious to learn about those examples from the past. Certainly, the way that the EU structured this possibility, in my opinion, puts the EU in an extremely strong position. Contrary to what the political commentators were saying about the fact that the um, separation of the UK would weaken the EU, I believe that the fact that this can be done strengthens the EU. And no, I don't believe that other states are going to follow shortly, big or small. They know it can be done, they've seen the process, and if and when they want to do it, they will be able to do it. But in the meantime, the EU can confidently confirm its democratic positions and principles, not only in theory, but in practice. The forces that structure our societies derive from the technologies that we have available. The necessity and the ability to produce food, goods and services at a very high efficiency leads to specialization across increasing geographical distances. We have supply chains englobing the entire planet. And we have, as a consequence, ties across nations. And we have the necessity, as a consequence, of nations coordinating their activities. This coordination, collaboration, leads to a peaceful coexistence. And this peaceful coexistence is at the basis of the birth of the EU. Originally, it was a trade agreement for the trade of carbon and steel. And then that agreement has been widened to other goods, eliminating tariffs, eliminating taxes on exporting and importing various types of goods, all goods within an ever-increasing set of countries. And then further treaties eased this collaboration, smoothed out the speed bumps to find ways of improving the production, the commerce, studying and living 
in any place within the EU. At the same time, it is my belief that the current wave of technologies are exercising an opposite force from this unification through the links created by trade and commerce and supply chains and the efficiencies of scale that these interconnected flows imply. These forces are leading towards decentralization. Solar energy, 3D printing, hydroponics, personalized health, peer-to-peer -peer learning, blockchain in finance, security systems that allow individuals to feel that they are protected in their communities regardless of a larger military protection that is supposed to be needed. And the governance models that allow the organization of activities done by the appropriate level of societal units in a lean, efficient manner. All these, in my definition, are leading towards what I call the network society. And the network society is opposed in dynamics to the nation state and even to this meta national units like the EU. So these two opposing forces are at play together. And Brexit is part of these memetic battles, these battles of ideas that are being born out of technologies that become available, that define the type of socio-economic organizations that the individuals live in. And the nation state needs to reassert itself. It needs to reassert itself in the UK through the process of Brexit, stopping the EU from absorbing its functions and making it apparently irrelevant. It needs to reassert itself in Spain, stopping the uh, provinces around Barcelona, the desire of that part of the country, of a given proportion of that part of the country, to become independent, breaking Spain apart. Now, in the past, patriotic and nationalistic forces could pretend, could create a narrative that represented nation states as sacred. They actually were sacred. They were often or universally the same as the church in their respective countries. There was no separation of state and church and as a consequence the state could leverage religion in order to assert its right to exist. These days, with a few exceptions, this cannot happen. And as a consequence, the state has to fight in order to prove itself worthy of being preserved. Now, these mimetic battles, even though they are expressed through the vehicles of our words, whether spoken or written or in internet videos or in uh, uh, TikTok dances, whatever the medium, even though we are the vehicles of this message, the core of 
the actionable steps and the outright final objective are beyond the scope and the reach of practically all of us, including those that believe because of the position they occupy that they are the leaders, they are the decision makers as they gather in exclusive places pretending to make or break the destiny of the world. These forces and these messages, these memetic battles are naturally beyond an individual. And if there are exceptions, those are important exceptions that we remember from the history books of individuals who we identify as having had lasting impact through their actions and ideas on the lives of tens or hundreds of millions of people and potentially billions today. But the vast majority understands that these forces are beyond what they can control. Rather than succumbing and allowing these forces to dominate their lives, what we have to recognize is that the individuals must achieve the practical right of going beyond these forces, of not being dominated by these forces. And specifically, what this means in the context of the nation-state resisting the forces of amalgamation of something like the EU or the forces of decentralization in Catalonia or a city wanting to organize itself in a radically different way than the country to which it belongs, what it means is that the individuals must be able to freely disassociate themselves from their country of residence or citizenship. Today, apolities, people who do not have a citizenship, are a vanishingly small minority of the world population. It is very hard. Even untouched aboriginous tribes in the various jungles remaining on the world are claimed by the respective countries containing those jungles as citizens of that country. And as a consequence, somebody wanting to live without being beholden to a country or a citizenship must proactively renounce his or her citizenship and then live with the consequences. But if we don't want a slim majority of a minority of the population to decide for everybody else in the domination of this process that we choose to call democratic but recognize its limitations, then we have to allow individuals to be freer than we allow them to be today. And we have to teach the various organizational units the confidence of the EU, the same confidence that the Lisbon Treaty illustrated allowing the separation of member states should be adopted by countries allowing their citizens to both physically leave 
as well as to separate their obligations from the country of their birth or the country of their residence or the country of their later adoption. And this should and can be tested. There are countries that are going in this direction, allowing both uh, an easier adoption of the country as a country of residence and citizenship, with many countries, for example, allowing you to reside in the country as long as you put down half a million euro or dollars and then acquire the passport of that country. And this is deemed very negatively, labeled negatively by a lot of observers, as if it didn't introduce a degree of freedom. Yes, it requires the person to be wealthy, but it still introduces a degree of freedom. Further, maybe the country can lower that. Or a larger country can say, well, maybe uh, 50,000 is enough, or 5,000 is enough. Who knows? And there are countries that make it harder and harder. They extend taxation, not only those that reside in the country, but are anywhere in the world. Regardless, as long as they are citizens, they must pay taxes. Or... If they want to renounce their citizenship, the bureaucratic process, rather than lasting a few days or weeks, is lasting months and months or even years. And rather than costing a few hundred euro or dollars, it is costing thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. An example of the first is Malta, member of the European Union, that allows people to become residents and citizens with the payment of a given amount of money. An example of the second is the feudal United States of America, where the historical lottery of you being born a citizen of the US implies a process where you are either permanently resident and a citizen and pay taxes forever, or pay taxes even when you are not a resident anymore, regardless of where you are in the world, or the payment of an increasingly high amount of money and the going through a gauntlet of a bureaucratic process, longer and longer, more and more complicated, in order to free yourself from the vassalage of the US citizenship. Now, of course, all of these are exaggerations because the process of Brexit is not going to create the uh, tragedy that uh, many have uh, described nor the triumph of uh, an economic renaissance, uh, a revival of uh, freedoms uh, that have been repressed by the EU previously, nor the uh, United States is a prison of a country. Many, many more people want to go live in the US and want to acquire the US uh, citizenship than not those that who want to leave. But still, these forces are at play. And when these forces are changing the balance, it is absolutely not the case that a large percentage of our idea complexes have to be adopted by a number of people in order to represent a, a substantial majority. On the contrary, ideas change, the zeitgeist changes already when a relatively small number of people want things to change. And then, let's hope that whatever changes are going to come, as we build a future of increasing degrees of freedom, 
as we recognize an increasing number of minorities fighting for the worthiness of their ideas and the ability to organize their lives according to those ideas, that this happens in a complicated, convoluted, protracted, expansive, wasteful, but peaceful manner as it has been for Brexit. Thank you.